we'll go over the autonomic nervous system. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so let's go over some of the uh, characteristics of the autonomic nervous system. And after this chapter, I really hope you, uh, you do get a, a better appreciation of some of the functions of the body. Uh, more so in, in bio uh, 211, you're really gonna see the autonomic nervous system applied more to those systems there. But we give you an introduction in this semester uh, just to kind of break things up a little bit. But if you have a pretty good understanding of the autonomic nervous system, and if you understand reflexes, right, both somatic and, and visceral reflexes, I think you're gonna do pretty well. Um, so what is the autonomic nervous system, all right? This is a system, obviously, it's one of the, uh, of the functional uh, parts of your nervous system. You have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system has several uh, characteristics. One, right, it's gonna mediate some of the involuntary actions, things that you really don't have any control over. For example, the heartbeat, digestive activity, and whatnot. So it is gonna regulate a lot of the organs inside of your body. And it's really important because the autonomic nervous system plays a large role in maintaining a healthy homeostatic system. So it's going to maintain the normal, the normal internal functions of your body. So we divide your autonomic nervous system into two divisions, right? We have the sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, and then we have the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. And I'm telling you from a clinical standpoint, all right, here in the United States, possibly all, all over the world, we spend way too much time utilizing the sympathetic division and not enough time utilizing the parasympathetic division. It's just one of the issues that uh, we see as healthcare providers. And so it's one of those things that should be addressed um, and that's why it's really important, folks, that I know that life gets hard and busy and you've got all this stuff going on, but it's really important that you take some time to relax, you take some time to get some rest, you take good care of yourself, get plenty of sleep. All of these help to tie in to a healthy homeostatic system of your body. So we're going to see how the body is going to respond in times of stress and at times when it's just hanging out and resting. And then we'll focus on which of those divisions, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic division is gonna be utilized during some of those times. So just a quick review, when we're talking about the nervous system, from a structural standpoint, structural is anatomical, our nervous system is broken down into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system, I'll jokingly say, is everything else, but that includes right, your nerves and the ganglia. <clears throat> so that's the structural organization. When we get into the functional organization, okay, we break down our nervous system into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So let's quickly review the somatic nervous system. This is a very important statement right here saying consciously perceived or controlled processes. So basically the first part of that statement talks about the sensory input. Your somatic nervous system is going to bring sensory input up to the central nervous system and you're gonna be able to consciously perceive whatever that stimuli was that the receptors transmitted the sensory input from. And then when we talk about the controlled processes, we're ta talking about the motor portion of the uh, nervous system there in the, in the somatic nervous system. So when we talk about control processes, we're talking about the voluntarily control processes, which means when we're discussing the output of the nervous system, we're talking about its effect or actually its response on the effectors. And as you know, the effectors are muscles and glands. Right? But when we're talking about voluntary or controlled processes, we're referring to right, the, the uh, effector glands specifically that we have voluntary control over. And the only um, tissue that we have voluntary control over 
out of that list of the factors is skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and the glands are all gonna fall into our autonomic nervous system. That's involuntarily controlled processes. So of course, you know, when we're discussing the nervous system, there's the sensory portion of it and the motor portion. The sensory is the input, all that information coming in. And so the somatic sensory is gonna relay right, sensory input from our special senses, touch, taste, smell, all right, hearing, equilibrium and balance, um, don't forget, when we're talking about touch, the tactile senses, right, we're not just specific to general touch. It's going to be deep touch, discriminative touch, uh, light touch, vibration, pain, temperature, all of that information comes from those receptors that sit in the skin. And then hopefully you recall what the proprioceptors are going to do. They're going to be located around the joints and in the muscles and the tendons. And it basically tells your central nervous system what those tissues, what those structures, i.e. the joints, what they're doing. Are they flexed? Are they extended? Are they rotated? All that information, the proprioceptors will provide your central nervous system. The other part of the nervous system is the motor aspect. So when we're talking about the somatic motor aspect. We're talking about motor command signals that come from the central nervous system and go to our effectors, which in this case, the only effectors that are in this category are gonna be skeletal muscles, voluntary movements that come from the cerebrum. And then also our reflexive movements that can either originate right, in the brain or the spinal cord. So those reflexive movements will either be a cranial reflex or a spinal reflex. And we learned a little bit about some of those spinal reflexes in chapter 14, right? The withdrawal reflex, the cross extensor reflex, the stretch reflex, the Golgi tendon reflex, right? all of those are some are spinal reflexes there. So a nice little review there of the somatic nervous system. Here's a nice picture here to really kind of put things into perspective. And I hope you really have a pretty good understanding at this point how, all right, the nervous system kind of operates in regards to information coming in and information leaving. So here we have an example of one of our sensory receptors in the skin, right? It is a somatic sensory receptor. So we're gonna be able to consciously perceive, right? This is a Pacinian corpuscle. So it has to do with touch. So all right, that skin is pressing up against something. It um, stimulates the receptor. It sends that sensory input up the sensory neuron. That sensory neuron is going to travel through the spinal nerve. <clears throat> And then that spinal nerve divides, right? And you can see we have this bulge here. That's the posterior root ganglion. That is where, right, the cell body of that primary neuron is going to be located. So that sensory neuron enters into the spinal cord through the posterior root here and enters into the back portion of the spinal cord. And then this, uh, de depending on what type of scenario this is, all right, we're eventually going to see the motor output is gonna exit out of the spinal cord through the anterior root. Only motor neurons are found in the anterior root. Only sensory neurons are found in the posterior root. But in our spinal nerve, it's a mixed nerve, meaning it has both sensory and motor neurons traveling there. So our murder neuron is gonna descend out of the spinal cord and head all the way out to the effector organ. In this case, it's the skeletal muscle. And it'll, and it'll cause some sort of action. So there's the, there's the basic premise there of the somatic nervous system. So we're gonna see some similarities when we get into the autonomic nervous system. A lot of when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, we're gonna be talking about the motor aspect of the autonomic nervous system compared to the sensory aspect. Sensory aspect, right, we briefly discussed the sensory aspect, right, when we were talking about um, um, the, uh, in chapter 14, about those, some of those different tracks there. It's very similar, in, in fact, that you'll just have, right, these different receptors allocated throughout, 
your body that are going to be involved in the autonomic nervous system. I'll talk about that here in a moment, okay? But first, all right, the autonomic nervous system is also known as the autonomic motor or the visceral motor system. And so again, it is going to process these regulated uh, physiological functions right below the consciousness level, which means you won't know what's going on for the most part. And you don't know when your respiration rate goes from 12 breaths a minute to 14 or 15 breaths a minute. When your cardiac output right, goes from 100 milliliters to 110 milliliters per heartbeat of blood pumping out. Right. My point being is you don't, you don't know this. So when we're learning about this, you're going to see more so, and I hate to say this, I know I say this a lot, but you're going to learn quite a bit of this, uh, these processes in, um, in bio 211 when we get to the specific organ systems. I'm going to give you a general broad overview here. So basically, right, the autonomic nervous system is going to transmit signals from the central nervous system out to our effector organs. Well, what is that? cardiac tissue in the heart, smooth muscle, and tons of systems throughout your body, blood vessels, respiratory system, digestive system, right? You're going to see it all over the place, reproductive system, urinary tract system, okay, all of that, and to, and to the glands. When you get into chapter 17, that's the first chapter that you'll cover in bio 211, you're going to learn about all that beautiful, uh, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? the symphony of, of those processes of the endocrine system. All right, so of course that sensory input is gonna come in from the periphery. So the autonomic uh, motor system is going to respond to all of that visceral sensory input. For example, the blood vessels, okay? You'll see how if the blood vessels they'll have these stretch receptors in the walls. And if your blood pressure increases, because maybe you're exercising and your blood is, your, your heart is pumping more blood. And, there, and so more blood goes into the blood vessels and it stretches out the blood vessel wall. That sensory input is gonna travel up to the brainstem. And so the, the brainstem is then going to process that information. And then it's gonna send down, all right, to the effector organ, its motor commands and how it's going to respond to that increased stretch in the blood vessels. How does it do that? It causes vasodilation, increases the diameter of the blood vessels, and it'll slow the heart down a little bit, or at least it'll try, decrease the heart rate and decrease how hard the heart's pumping. So this, all of this is to help to maintain homeostasis, that healthy, normal, functioning of all the systems and the organism, which is you as a whole. So we try to keep all of these uh, 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 stimuli, these changes and the, the, the response to these changes within a certain range in the body. So for example, going back to blood pressure, right? Average blood pressure is about 120 over 80. And so when you start to exercise, it increases. And so your blood pressure, we want to keep your blood pressure when you are in a normal situation as you're sitting here right now, we would like to keep your blood pressure about the average of 120 over 80, maybe a little bit less, maybe 110 over 70 or 75. Okay, but regardless, there's a range there. We don't want it to drop below 90 over 60, and we don't want it to go above 140 over 90. So we have this range, just like your body temperature. 98.6 is the average temperature. But if you go up above 100, 101, 102, we start to get nervous. If you drop down to 94, 93 degrees, we start to get nervous. All right. So we want to keep all, right, all, of, all of these measurements within a certain range. And the autonomic nervous system helps to maintain those ranges. So here you can see... All right, nice diagram here representing the respiratory system. So here you have your lungs and you have these visceral sensory neurons. And what they're doing is they monitor, okay, sensory input coming from the lungs. For example, stretch on the lung tissue and the blood vessels 
that are going to be found inside of these organs here. And so they're going to transmit that information up to the central nervous system. Now, it's going to be a little bit of a different pathway when, we, when we're talking about the motor pathway, but essentially the sensory nervous uh, neuron will travel up, ascend up into your central nervous system. And then all right, your autonomic nervous system is going to respond to that sensory input and it's going to decide on how it's going to respond. And so it's going to then respond by sending its motor command output out through the motor neuron, of course, exiting the spinal cord, heading through the anterior roots into the spinal nerve. It'll take a little bit more of a complicated route. We're going to go through some of this material in this chapter. Right, but it'll eventually get back down to the effector organ. And depending on what that effector organ is, if it's smooth muscle that's found in the blood vessels of the respiratory system, right, or if it's going to be that you're breathing too heavy, it'll slow down your respiration rate, maybe for a specific response. Or maybe we need to increase some of the mucus output in your respiratory tree here because you've traveled from the country where the air is beautiful and clean and crisp to the inner city of some big industrial uh, uh, um, metropolitan area, and there's an increased pollution rate. And so your body's like, well, the heck with that. I got to produce more mucus to protect the respiratory epithelium. So all of that can happen. And we're going to learn about how some of that works here, all right, today and on um, Thursday. All right, so let's start off by talking, like I said, if you notice here, all right, on our slides here, all right, um, the, the, the sensory part is pretty basic. You have your primary sensory neuron that's going to ascend up into the central nervous system. Where it gets a little bit different is when we talk about the motor aspect. So that's what we're gonna be doing a lot today is talking about, all right, the motor, uh, the autonomic motor neurons here, okay? So let's start off by comparing, all right, the lower motor neurons of the somatic nervous system to the lower motor neurons of the autonomic nervous system. So as you recall, the lower motor neuron of the somatic nervous system, you just had one, okay? And it extended out from the central nervous system out to the effector organ. In this case, it was the skeletal muscle. So the cell body for the lower motor neuron was located either in the brain stem or the spinal cord. If it's in the brain stem, more than likely, and we're gonna talk about this in lab today, it is involved with the cranial nerves. As you know, cranial nerve is a nerve that comes off the brain. And then if the cell body is in the spinal cord, or right, usually in the, it's located in the anterior gray matter, then it is going to, it's going to uh, be part of, of, of um, I totally lost my train of thought of being distracted here by my son. All right, the cell body is going to exit out of the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord and become uh, go out to the effector tissue. So all of these neurons, or excuse me, not, well, yeah, the neurons, um, their axons are going to be myelinated and they'll have a large diameter, which is normally going to be like an alpha motor neuron. Those are the largest, the largest of the uh neurons or, or nerves because they have the biggest diameter. The neurotransmitter that our lower motor neurons release onto the muscle fiber is going to be acetylcholine and it's always going to excite that muscle tissue. Never inhibits, always excites. Okay, so cell body located in the brainstem or the spinal cord. Brainstem, think cranial nerve. Spinal cord thinks spinal nerve. That's what I was trying to say, the spinal nerve earlier. Right. These lower motor neurons for the somatic nervous system are myelinated and they have a large diameter. So the nerve signals are gonna travel very fast. And the neurotransmitter that is released is acetylcholine and that's going to excite the muscle tissue. So that should be a nice review there. We already know that um, acetylcholine is the, neuro, is the um, neurotransmitter when we're dealing with skeletal muscle tissues. Now. We're going to change things up a little bit. Now we're going to talk about the lower motor neuron that is involved in the um, autonomic nervous system. And so when we're dealing with the autonomic nervous system, we're going to be utilizing a chain 
of two motor neurons. So we're going to replace the one lower motor neuron in the somatic nervous system with a chain of two motor neurons in the autonomic nervous system. So the very first neuron in this chain, we call that the preganglionic neuron. So its cell body, similar to what we saw with the lower motor neuron, is going to be found in the brainstem or the spinal cord. Okay, okay, I can, I can deal with that. I already know that for the, for the um, lower motor neuron for the somatic nervous system, right? A little bit of a difference here. Yes, it's myelinated, okay, but it is smaller, it's thinner. And so this neuron, the axon, is going to head out to the periphery and somewhere in the periphery, right, it will synapse in what we call an autonomic ganglion. Well, we already know that a ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies, and that's usually where we'll see a synapse, right? So since we're dealing with the autonomic nervous system, let's call our ganglion an autonomic ganglion, meaning, okay, that ganglion is associated with the autonomic nervous system, and it's somewhere out in the periphery. So it's part of the peripheral nervous system. And at the beginning of this lecture, I was telling you, okay, when we're dealing with our, the, the structural organization of our nervous system, our central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is made up of everything else, but pretty much it's made up of nerves and ganglia. Okay, so last thing for the preganglionic neuron, it also releases acetylcholine. Well, that's good to know. And it will excite the second motor neuron. Hoorah. Okay, good. So there's not too much new information there. A little bit, a little bit. All right. So now we synapse on our, our, from our preganglionic neuron onto our second motor neuron, which we call the postganglionic neuron or the ganglionic neuron. I'll tell you what, folks. Me personally, I will be using this term here, postganglionic, because it's hard. It's it's easier to use that instead of ganglionic because some people get confused with ganglion. Okay, so the second motor neuron, right, is gonna be the postganglionic neuron. And so this, the cell body of the postganglionic neuron will be found in that autonomic ganglion that we were just talking about in the peripheral nervous system. All right, so this one here, okay, a little bit of a difference here, it is even thinner then the first motor neuron in our chain, the preganglionic neuron, and it's unmyelinated. And so this uh, neuron is going to synapse onto the effector. And if you don't know it by now, folks, you've got to know this. The effectors for, oh, I hate when that happens. The effectors are in the autonomic nervous system are gonna be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glands, things that we can't control. And so these autonomic neurons here, these postganglionic neurons are going to release either acetylcholine or we have a new neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. And so they'll release right, either acetylcholine or norepinephrine onto their effector. And now it can either excite or inhibit the effector, depending on what receptors are activated by the neurotransmitters that are being released, okay? So here's an awesome picture. Let's start here on the left side of our screen and work our way over. Here's our central nervous system. Now I want you to notice something here. Look where the cell body is of our preganglionic neuron. It is in the lateral gray horn. This is the lateral gray horn. Up front here is the anterior gray horn. The cell bodies of somatic lower motor neurons are found in the, in the anterior gray horn. The cell bodies of, autonomic ner of, of the autonomic um, neurons are gonna be found here in the lateral gray horn. So here's the cell body in the lateral gray horn. You'll notice that the preganglionic neuron is myelinated and it's somewhat thin. 
So it's going to leave the spinal cord, leave our central nervous system and travel out to the autonomic ganglion that's somewhere out the periphery, just hanging out there. So it's gonna travel out there and it's going to synapse onto the second motor neuron, the postganglionic axon, and it's going to release acetylcholine, which will always be excitatory. And the acetylcholine is gonna stimulate the opening of the nicotinic receptors. You have nicotinic receptors and you're gonna hear me talk about adrenergic receptors here. But the nicotinic receptors are stimulated to open up or, or, or to open up the channels here through acetylcholine. And that excites the postganglionic axon, which is thin, very thin and unmyelinated. And that postganglionic axon is going to head out to the effector organ which is cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or gland. And that postganglionic axon right, will release acetylcholine or norepinephrine, and it will either excite the effector organ or inhibit the effector organ, depending on which right, receptors are activated by which neurotransmitter is being released. So I strongly urge you to take a look at this figure 15-2 and understand it. Because for the rest of this class, because I'll be referring to all right, these uh, ganglia, excuse me, these neurons, you should just have a general kind of understanding because we're gonna be mapping out some of the pathways that these autonomic uh, lower motor neurons are going to take on their way out to the effector organs from the central nervous system here. All right, so continuing on with the lower motor neurons, there is an advantage that the autonomic nervous system chain has over the somatic nervous system single neuron. Right. And so that advantage is these two concepts. We have a concept called neuronal convergence in which we'll have many preganglionic neurons synapsing onto one ganglionic neuron, that's called converging. Right? All these uh, neurons are converging onto one postganglionic neuron. The other one is neuronal divergence. And we'll see all right, several branches of an axon from one single preganglionic neuron synapsing all right, with many postganglionic neurons, and that's called neuronal divergence. I don't know why I always think of that movie Divergence um, in regards to that, okay? But these two concepts, neuro neuronal convergence and neuronal divergence will allow, all right, for certain processes, like for example, fight or flight, all right? That is important because right, you're gonna have neuronal divergence. We're gonna have, it's called the mass effect. So if you need to get a lot of activities or metabolic processes going all at once, neuronal divergence helps with that. All right, so what controls the autonomic nervous system? Well, yes, the central nervous system does, okay? But there's certain parts of the central nervous system that play a large role in controlling the autonomic nervous system. We talked about some of these structures, right? When we were going over the brain and the spinal cord. So obviously the autonomic nervous system is gonna be regulated by the central nervous system, okay? The big player here in the autonomic nervous system, and you probably remember me talking about it in chapter 13 is the hypothalamus. I mean, this thing does it all. And so it's gonna control, all right, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So for example, when you're entering into fight or flight mode, that's activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Say you're being chased by a bear. Are you happy when that happens? Are you glad? No, you're terrified. You're freaking out. You're losing your mind. You're fearful. So the hypothalamus, all right, will help with processing that emotional response to the stimuli during the fight or flight response, all right? We'll also see how the cerebral cortex plays a role in that. Well, you know, the frontal lobe there has to do with the um, uh, um, interpretation of emotions, right? And how you process those, 
All right, the thalamus, of course, there's our relay system involved with that. And of course, you can't have a conversation about the uh, 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 about emotions and not talk about the limbic system. All right, so the hypothalamus plays a role in that. All right, the next structure is the brainstem here. When we were going over the different parts of the brainstem, we learned like in parts of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, specifically the medulla oblongata, right, you have a lot of nuclei in those areas that will help to control our visceral reflexes. What's a visceral reflex? It's a reflex that involves organ re uh, uh, responses to something. And I use the stomach all the time. Maybe it's because I'm hungry all the time. Um, but if we increase the stretch on the stomach wall, we start to increase uh, the gastric juices and the digestive enzymes to help break down the food and liquid uh, uh, products that are inside the stomach. Blood pressure is another example, right? When we talk about the vasomotor center there, right? How, if your blood pressure increases, how uh, parts of your vascular system and the cardiovascular or the cardiac uh, uh, response, excuse me, the cardiac portion, all right, of your cardiovascular uh, system, how it responds to try to decrease the blood pressure and vice versa. If your blood pressure starts to bottom out and get really low, how your uh, cardiovascular system responds to that. We did see how the spinal cord is involved in some of the spinal uh, reflexes for the somatic nervous system, but you're going to learn in this chapter how it plays a role in the autonomic nervous system reflexes, especially when we're talking about defecation and urination. Right? In case you don't know what that is, defecation is pooping and urination is peeing. All right? And specifically, all right, the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is going to affect those reflexes there. And we'll talk about that in this chapter too. So here you can see an awesome picture right, showing us all right, where these autonomic functions are going to occur within our brain and spinal cord there. Right. Again, the hypothalamus plays a huge role in the integration control center for a lot of these motor commands and that sensory input that's coming from specific areas in regards to uh, responses uh, in, that involve the autonomic nervous system there. All right, so let's talk about, all right, the two divisions. You've heard me mention them. Let's really talk about it. So we've got the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division, all right? And it's true, they do have complementary functions, all right, uh, where one is lacking, the other one, you know, might pick up. But it's, I don't want you to think that they're always opposing in how, in, in the responses that occur. A lot of students will say, oh, well, if the sympathetic division is for fight or flight, then the parasympathetic is going to be opposite for that in all of its uh, aspects, it's not, all right? So that being said, when we talk about this, the parasympathetic division, rest and digest. What's supposed to be happening during that time? When we talk about resting and digesting, yes, we're going to break down, all right, food and liquid that you have consumed, all right, down to their smaller macromolecules. And then we're gonna try to absorb those nutrients to increase our energy reserves. So we're going to replenish nutrients that we might have used up if we were exercising or doing whatever. And at the same time, all right, when you are in, when your parasympathetic division is working quite a bit, you're going to be conserving energy. All right, so for the sympathetic, the fight or flight, you can see, all right, we're going to utilize the sympathetic division during times of exercise, all right, excitement and emergency, hence the fight or flight. But Exercise, think of, uh, of your, um, ner not nervous systems, but different systems like your skeletal muscle uh, is going to be engaging in a lot of activity during a run. And so you are going to be utilizing the sympathetic division much more than the parasympathetic division. And it doesn't make sense if you're running, all right, and your skeletal muscles need blood and the nutrients in the blood, all right, to supply energy for those muscles. Well, it, it doesn't make sense that, 
that that blood that you need for those muscles to go to your stomach to uh, start to uh, when you're trying to break down a hot pocket that you may have had three hours before your run, right? That's not important enough at the time. All right, so this slide here shows right, um, the differences between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic lower motor neurons. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these here with you. And then I've got this awesome picture on this slide to really kind of hammer it home for you folks. So another name for the parasympathetic uh, nervous system or division of the autonomic nervous system is the cranial sacral division. And the reason why that is, if I zoom in here a little bit, right, when we're dealing with the parasympathetic, all right, the cranial sacral division is the cranial portion of the cranial sacral division is made up of four cranial nerves that come off, obviously, the brainstem. So we refer to that as the cranial portion. And then the sacral division, all right, that comes from S2, S3, and S4 segments off of the spinal cord there. So that is why we call the parasympathetic division also the cranial sacral division. So when we're looking at our preganglionic neurons, you recall what those are, okay? Remember we have two neurons in our lower motor neuron chain. And so the preganglionic neurons are, the cell bodies are either going to be in the brainstem and various nuclei in the brainstem, usually cranial nerves, or it's going to be in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. And in this case, it'll be in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord in segments S2, S3, and S4, located down at the bottom of our spinal cord. So that's the preganglionic neurons. All right, our preganglionic neurons will be long. And our postganglionic neurons, all right, the axons are short. Okay, so that means because the preganglionic axons are long and the postganglionic axons are short, the ganglia have to be close to the effector organ, and sometimes they'll be inside the effector organ wall, like in the intestines, for example. And we've seen the preganglionic axons will have fewer branches. All right, so let's just look at that first, and then I'll come back and do the uh, the um, I'll do this uh, sympathetic division. Okay, so parasympathetic division, also known as the cranial sacral division. You need to know these four cranial nerves, all right, are part of the parasympathetic division. Cranial nerve three, cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve nine. Cranial nerve 10, ocular motor, facial glossal pharyngeal vagus. Those are your four cranial nerves. Right. Then you can see down here, we have S2, S3, and S4 segments off the spinal cord. That's our sacral portion. And then those segments will form our pelvic splanchnic nerves all right, later on. We'll get into that. So the purpose of our parasympathetic all right, division is to help to maintain homeostasis in regards to functions of resting and digesting, conserving energy, replenishing any energy stores that have been depleted for whatever reason, okay? Just getting the body back to making it ready, like battle ready in case something happens. All right, so we'll see those preganglionic neurons are either gonna be located in the brainstem here because they're part of our uh, cranial nerves, or they'll be found down here in S2, 3, or 4 uh, segments of the spinal cord in the uh, lateral gray horn there. So our parasympathetic, when we're looking at the parasympathetic neurons here, our preganglionic neuron is going to be long. And our postganglionic neuron will be short. So the ganglia has to be close to the effector. And in some cases, it can be inside the organ wall. All right, so we refer to those types of ganglia as terminal ganglia or intramural ganglia. Mural is wall. 
So these ganglia, the intramural ganglia, will actually be in the organ wall there. All right, so that is the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic division is also known as the thracolumbar division. And that's because the preganglionic neurons are going to be located in the lateral horns of T1 through L2. T1 through L2. So when we compare the sympathetic neurons to the uh, uh, parasympathetic neurons, we flip it. The preganglionic axons are short, whereas in the parasympathetic division, they're long. And the postganglionic axons are long, which is the opposite of the postganglionic axons in the parasympathetic division. So in, now in this situation, we have to bring our ganglia close to the spinal cord real close. And these preganglionic axons will have many or several branches that come off. So if you look here, all right, here's our sympathetic division, thracolumbar. All right, our preganglionic neurons are going to be located in the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord at T1 all the way down to L2, hence thoracolumbar division. So the function of all right, the sympathetic division is to obviously, yes, to help maintain homeostasis, but also through the processes of that fight or flight. So it's going to, we're gonna uh, rely on the sympathetic division when we're exercising, in cases of emergency, right? It helps with increasing a lot of our metabolic functions in our body. For example, right, we've got to run away from that bear. So we need to be able to have plenty of energy to produce that ATP, right, for our skeletal muscles. So this system will help us with that. So when we're looking at the sympathetic division, you'll notice the preganglionic neuron the axon is short, but look at all these branches coming off. So these branches can go out to other ganglia and stimulate many more postganglionic neurons here. Our postganglionic neuron in the sympathetic division is long. So these ganglia have to be close to our spine, okay? Close to the spine. All right, so. I mentioned this before when I was kind of talking about the mass activation and we got into a little bit when I was talking about how the sympathetic division has uh, many branches in the preganglionic axon. Uh, and so that helps, right, when we're trying to stimulate several organ systems at once. Unfortunately, the parasympathetic, because it has few branches, right, it keeps its responses pretty local, you know? So that means we can only affect a few effectors at the same time. But when we involve the sympathetic division, okay, and because we have all of those branches, then we can get what we call mass activation. And so all of those many branches from our preganglionic axon are going to simultaneously just start hitting all of these various effectors, smooth muscle and tissues all over the place. Um, for your blood vessels, let's say, we're gonna vasodilate those so we can increase the blood flow to get blood out to all those effector um, organs uh, all throughout the body, all right? Especially when we're dealing with exercise, all right? You need, all right, a lot of muscle groups to get that blood so we are going to need to see that stimulation of those many organ systems there. And of course, we'll get into this a little bit in this chapter, what happens when we stimulate the adrenal medulla, right? That will help with the release of certain, certain hormones. Some of you may have heard uh, of adrenaline, okay? But we're gonna actually put a much more appropriate name on that, all right, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which 
is going to be secreted by the neurosecretory cells in the adrenal medulla, right? The sympathetic nervous system is going to stimulate these neurosecretory cells in your adrenal gland to pump out norepinephrine and epinephrine. So we can get, right, that fight or flight response. All right, so let's start off and do a little bit of talking here about the parasympathetic division. All right, so think of rest and digest, but our main goal is always to maintain homeostasis for both divisions, okay? So the parasympathetic division is gonna maintain homeostasis at rest. The sympathetic division is gonna maintain homeostasis, right? In an emergency situation or during exercise and whatnot, okay? So we know it's the cranial sacral division. We called it that before. We know where everything is gonna be found. So when we talk about our ganglia, right? There's two types. The terminal ganglia are gonna be close to the effector and the intramural, mural, right? Mural is wall. Intramural is going to be found within the wall of the target organ. And I told you before, we'll see that in the intestines, for example. Okay, so those are the two types of ganglia based on their locations. Terminal ganglia, real close to the effector. Intramural ganglia, we're close, we're inside, all right? We're in the effector. All right, so let's talk about the cranial components to the parasympathetic nervous system, also known as the cranial sacral division. So there are four cranial nerves, and you'll have a little bit of a better understanding when I do it in lab today. Uh, we'll talk about these four nerves, um, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you where they are in the brain, in the um, brainstem there. Okay, you have the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve three, facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, glossal pharyngeal, cranial nerve nine, and then vagus, cranial nerve ten. So let's talk about where these cranial nerves originate. All right, so ocular motor, look at the name. Oculo has to do with the eye. Motor, obviously, this nerve is going to move the eye. So the preganglionic axons, right, those cell bodies are gonna be located in the midbrain. And so they'll exit from the brainstem and they will travel all the way to the ciliary ganglia. Now keep in mind, right, we're dealing with the parasympathetic nervous system. So the ganglia are always going to be close or even within the actual effector, okay? So ocular motor nerve, all right, it's preganglionic axons are gonna synapse in the ciliary ganglion and that is close to your eye, it's actually in your orbit. So the post, and I'll, uh, go into more detail in chapter 16 as to all the muscles that the ocular motor uh, nerve controls, okay? But the postganglionic axons, right, exit the ciliary ganglion, and they're going to control the ciliary muscle. This is the muscle that changes the shape of your lens. So when you're looking at something far away, and then you glance down at something close, like say you're driving and you're keeping an eye on traffic in front of you, and the closest car in front of you is about 20 yards away, and you quickly glance to look down at the clock on your dashboard, okay, now you're going to change your focus to something closer. Well, the ciliary muscle is going to affect the shape of your lens so you can focus and see it, whatever, you are, whatever you're looking at more clearly. We'll also see all right, the postganglionic axons are going to control the sphincter muscle in your iris. That results in constriction of the pupil. It makes your pupil smaller, lets less light in, and focuses the light more on the sharper area inside of your retina there. When I say the sharper area, the area where you get better um, um, clarity of whatever it is that you're looking at. All right, so the ocular motor nerve, when we're dealing with the parasympathetic nervous system and its effects, it is going to change the shape of the lens by controlling the ciliary muscle. We call that accommodation. And it's going to constrict the pupil through the sphincter muscle in the iris. That's ocular motor. Facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, 
All right, its cell bodies all right, are located in the pons. That's the middle segment of your brain stem. All right, so those preganglionic axons extend out from the pons and they're gonna go to either the pterygopalatine ganglia or the submandibular ganglia. So the preganglionic axons will synapse in either one of those ganglia. The postganglionic axons, all right, that come out of the pterygopalatine ganglion are going to control the lacrimal gland in the lateral aspect of your eye, tears. Helps to control tears in your eye. It'll also control some of the glands in your nose and mouth. All right, the postganglionic axons that emerge and come out of the submandibular ganglion, they're going to control the salivary glands of the submandibular glands and the sublingual glands. So if your mouth starts to water, your facial nerve plays a role in that because it is going to be activating the submandibular and the sublingual glands to get you ready for digestion. One of the early parts of the digestive process is if you smell something and your mouth starts to water, boom, you're digesting right now. Or, not, or if that's happening, I'm not saying it's happening now. I am. All right, glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine. All right, the preganglionic axons are going to extend out of the medulla oblongata and head towards the otic ganglion that is near the ear. All right, the otic ganglion's postganglionic axons are going to stimulate the parotid salivary gland which is the largest of the salivary glands. And that's located, believe it or not, right by the ramus of your jaw in front of your ear. If you ever get mumps, all right, that's when you get the parotid gland becomes inflamed. All right, and finally, vagus nerves. One of the coolest cranial nerves, it does a lot. And when I talk to you about it in lab today, you'll see what I'm talking about, all right? The cell bodies of the preganglionic axons are located once again in the medulla oblongata, and they will exit out of the medulla oblongata, and they will travel to multiple, multiple, many ganglia located all throughout the thorax and abdomen. I could spend a very long time going through all that. I won't, okay? All you need to know is that the vagus nerve is going to innervate many different organs and organ systems in your thorax and in your abdominal area there. All right. Some of the functions that the vagus nervous is going to have a hand in is going to be slowing down your heart rate, causing bronchial constriction of the bronchioles in your respiratory system. Remember, Vegas, uh, I'm sorry, parasympathetic division is rest and digest. So it is actually going to increase digestive secretions, increasing, all right, stomach acid and some of the actual digestive enzymes that are released in the stomach and in your small intestine. And also plays a role, remember, is to replenish nutrients. So we're going to help to store carbohydrates by stimulating certain processes like uh, glycogenesis, in which we're gonna take glucose and store it as glycogen. All right, so that's the cranial portion of the cranial sacral division. What about the sacral division? All right, we talked about the pelvic splanchnic nerves. The pelvic splanchnic nerves are going to be, all right, the preganglionic axons, which are located in all right, the lateral gray regions of S2, 3, and S4. So those are going to exit out from the spinal cord, and they're going to then head out to either a terminal or intramural ganglia located near our effector. So there's a couple different plexuses, and this is a kind of a new term for us when we're talking about what a plexus is, 
a plexus is going to be a grouping of nerves, all right? So here in the pelvic splanchnic nerves, all right, these pelvic splanchnic nerves will form the superior and the inferior hypogastric plexuses. And they're gonna go and innervate various tissues in the abdominal and pelvic region here. So for example, you'll see smooth muscle contraction. Where could that possibly be? Well, all right, that could be in various regions throughout your digestive system, specifically the terminal end of the digestive system, including the rectum, the large intestine, parts of the small intestine, all right? We're gonna see increased secretions, all right, in the urinary and digestive systems because, all right, when we are starting to digest food, all right, we need secretions of digestive enzymes and also mucus, to help lubricate our digestive tract so we don't start to damage things. And then of course, in our, our reproductive system, we'll see a uh, penile and clitoral erection there. So this picture here is showing you all these uh, vast structures here. We'll start up here, the cranial division, you can see the individual cranial nerves, all right? And their associated ganglia here and then the end organs here. I know I already talked about it, so I won't go through that, all right? But cranial nerve three, all right, will um, have its preganglionic neuron synapsing at the ciliary ganglion onto the postganglionic neuron that heads out, all right, to a variety of different structures related to the eye. And then you can see, look at, for example, cranial nerve 10, it's a killer. Look at all these plexi, but more importantly, look at all these different organs, okay? It goes on and on and on, right? So again, the vagus nerve, and I don't think I've told you folks this, but if you're sitting down and you're taking a test and you have no idea what the answer is, you studied really hard, your brain's fried, right? You have no idea what the answer is. If one of the answer choices is the vagus nerve, you should mark it down. That's what I, I, that's what I always did, vagus nerve. And in most times I was right, because if you look at the picture here, you can see the vagus nerve, all right, innervates all these various structures all over the place here. And then when we get down here to the sacral division, you'll see S2, 3, and 4 coming off of the spinal cord here. And they'll form the pelvic splanchnic nerves. And those pelvic splanchnic nerves all right, we'll then form these hypogastric plexi, the superior and inferior hypogastric plexi. And then they'll give off nerves that will innervate just various structures throughout, all right? Some of our reproductive organs, some of our urinary tract organs, all right? Some of the distal portions of our digestive system here and some other structures here, all right, in the reproductive system. All right, so that's the parasympathetic division there. Um, I'll start off here talking a little bit about the sympathetic division, and then we'll, uh, we'll take our break here. All right, our sympathetic division, okay, utilized in cases of emergency and exercise, right, also known as the thoracolumbar division. Right, in this scenario here, the ganglia are going to be close to the central nervous system because our preganglionic axons are short. But we're going to go through a number of these pathways here. This is where stuff kind of gets a little bit more complicated. So I'll talk for a little bit and then I'm going to take a break because I know that you folks need your brains to be rested when I get into these pathways. I already taught this stuff earlier uh, this morning, right? But it's a lot to take in, okay? So let's first look at, all right, some of the organization and basically the anatomy of the sympathetic division here. All right, so let's start off with our preganglionic neurons. The cell bodies are gonna be found in the lateral horn, right, at the spinal segments of T1 through L2. And of course, they're gonna be myelinated, and so they're gonna exit out of the anterior roots of the T1 through L2 spinal segments, and they will then travel into the spinal nerves. And this is when things start to get a little complicated because we're going to start to see, all right, them branch off. So before I go over that, I want to talk to you about some of the structures here so you can understand 
what, where things are going and what's happening when these um, neurons do branch off. Okay, so there's a structure called the sympathetic trunk and the sympathetic ganglia, which are part of a trunk. So I want you to think, all right, of the sympathetic trunk and ganglia as a pearl necklace, except the, the, the uh, pearls, yeah, the pearls are not going to be one against the next one. You know, remember when we were talking about actin and myosin and actin, all right, our thin myofilament there uh, was a, 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 a pearl necklace twisted with another pearl necklace. It's a little bit different than that. So you're going to have the actual string, which is going to be made up of the axons. And then, of course, you're going to have a ganglion, a bulge here, which is going to be the cell bodies. That's where the synapsing goes on. Then we have, you know, another string. Then we have another ganglion. And pretty much at each level of the spinal cord, you're going to have a ganglion. Okay, so keep in mind, the string is the axons, the pearls are going to be the ganglion. We all know what's going to be in the ganglion, cell bodies, synapsin. Okay. So you've got a sympathetic trunk on either side of your spine. It's going to be just, and when I say just, it is just lateral to the vertebral column there. So you're going to have a right sympathetic trunk and ganglia. You're going to have a left sympathetic trunk and ganglia. All right. So they're going to be right outside. Because keep in mind, Remember what I said, with the sympathetic division, all right, the pre-ganglionic axons are short. So the ganglia have to be close to the spine. The post-ganglionic axons are long. All right, so when we're looking at the sympathetic trunk and ganglia, like I said, each ganglion is going to be associated with each spinal nerve. But of course, we always have to mess this up, right? Somewhere. It wouldn't be anatomy and physiology if there wasn't something. When I try to tell you a concept, there wasn't something that was going to mess up the concept. So in the cervical portion, all right, there's only three ganglia, three in the cervical portion. You have the superior, the middle, and inferior cervical ganglia. So the superior cervical ganglia, which is normally the largest of the three ganglia, okay, this is going to be where our postganglionic axons exits and go out to the effectors. Okay, well, these postganglionic axons are going to go out to the head, neck, and thoracic viscera. So what are some of these structures? Well, look at the list below. Sweat glands, that's a gland. That's still a gland, right? So that falls within our effector organs. Blood vessels, we're talking about the smooth muscle in those blood vessels. So we can vasodilate or vasoconstrict. The dilator pupillae muscle, okay? That muscle is going to dilate the pupil of your eye. So this should bring, this should kind of raise an eyebrow to you right now. And I kind of say that jokingly because all right, the superior tarsal muscle of the eyelid helps to raise your eyelid, right? But in this case, when I say raise an eyebrow, remember when I was talking about the ocular motor nerve, all right, which was part of the parasympathetic division and how it controls the sphincter of the iris and it will cause the pupil to constrict? Then now we just learned all right, that here in the superior cervical ganglia, you have postganglionic axons that are going to go to the head, and it's going to control the dilator pupillae muscle, that that muscle causes the pupil to dilate. So an easy way to remember that is, if you've ever seen a cartoon and, and a cartoon character gets scared by something and their eyes like shoot out of their head, but they get really big. Okay, the eyes get really wide, okay? And that's because they're undergoing a sympathetic fight or flight response. So their eyes get really big. Their pupils get really big. Well, the opposite happens in the parasympathetic. The pupils get really small. So the sympathetic division is gonna dilate your pupils. The parasympathetic division is going to constrict the pupil. Okay, 
The other two ganglions are the middle and inferior cervical ganglions. And so these uh, postganglionic axons are going to innervate the thoracic organs here. So if we look at our picture, I'll show you. I'm going to come right back to the Horner syndrome here. I just want to show you this while I have it in my head. Okay, so here you can see, here are the three ganglia, superior cervical ganglia, middle cervical ganglia, inferior cervical ganglia. So you can see the superior cervical ganglia is going to go and innervate all right, the effectors in the head, in the neck, all right, and also in the thoracic region there. And then the middle and inferior cervical ganglia, they're going to innervate the thoracic viscera. They don't contribute to the head and neck. The superior cervical ganglia does. So that leads me to our first clinical view of the night, Horner's syndrome. So you're minding your own business. You're walking down the street and someone throws a rock and it hits you in the neck. Ouch. And then it hits you right where your neck and your shoulders meet. And they have successfully damaged, all right, um, your sympathetic, your cervical sympathetic trunk. And they even damaged your T1 ganglion here. So as a result, you will have, all right, what we call ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and facial flushing. These are the four clinical hallmark symptoms of Horner syndrome when you damage your cervical sympathetic trunk. All right, the ptosis here is where we're gonna see the paralysis of that superior tarsal muscle. Remember I told you, right, that superior tarsal muscle is the muscle of your eyelid, helps to raise your eyelid. So if you damage the nerve, all right, or the axons that innervate that muscle, you get paralysis, so you get drooping of your upper eyelid there, the superior eyelid. Meiosis, right, remember we talked about, all right, the pupil, uh, the pupillator, the dilator pupillae muscle, right, is now not going to work because we've damaged the neurons that stimulate it to dilate. So what we'll see is since it can't dilate, the parasympathetic nervous system is free at will to constrict the pupil. There's no opposition to the constriction with dilation because our dilator muscle is busted. So all we can do is constrict the pupil. Anhydrosis, you're not sweating anymore. Sweating only has to do with the sympathetic nervous system, right? And since it's not receiving any input from the sympathetic nervous system, or excuse me, output, I should say, from the sympathetic nervous system, you can't sweat. And also, since the sympathetic nervous system has been damaged, we'll talk more about this at the end of this chapter when we're talking about this, the uh, autonomic nervous system's effect on your blood vessels there. The sympathetic nervous system is what controls the dilation and constriction of your blood vessels. Since we've damaged that, the only thing your blood vessels can do is vasodilate. And when you vasodilate, more blood flows to that area, hence the flushing. You appear more red. So ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and facial flushing. All right, so here you can see in a live, gross, all right, picture here. Here's our uh, aorta, okay? You can also see the azygos vein, right? And we've dissected out, yep, it looks like we, well, here's the superior vena cava. We got rid of the inferior vena cava on the heart. But what we're seeing here is on either side of the spine here, here is the sympathetic trunk, all right? Here's the sympathetic trunk. Here's a ganglia, all right? Here's another ganglia, all right? So we're seeing that, and then we're gonna get into this, not tonight, all right? The gray and white rami communicantes, all right? Those are the on and off ramps from our spinal nerve. And then we'll talk about the uh, splanchnic nerves um, next class. This is a perfect place for me to stop. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here, all right? And uh, uh, next class, uh, we'll catch up and uh, we'll discuss 
uh, the uh, organization of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. All right, so let's take a break. Um, and before I forget, 